Um, I was just saying that it's so wonderful to have all of you uh, logging in from various parts of the world. And if you could just let us know where you're from, it'd be kind of interesting, I think, for this community to see um, how extensive the teachings are going uh, in different parts of the world. I know that some of you have asked about different time zones. So I'm imagining that you're not all on the West Coast, but from various parts of um, you know, the country, uh, maybe even overseas. Um, some of the names I notice are maybe from Asia. So we'd love to see where you're from, where you're logging in from. Um, and we'll be continuing this course next month uh, in a series up until uh, November. Every month, uh, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi will be taking a chapter of the Comprehensive Manual of Abhidhamma. Um, <clears throat> so we'll be uh, getting to know each other in terms of seeing each other's faces and would love to see faces if possible, if we could turn on our, our video camera um, so we can see us in our individual boxes. We're based in Berkeley, California on the West Coast uh, in the heart of downtown Berkeley in a place called Dharma College. And um, you're welcome to look us up at www.dharma dash college.com and uh, we teach classes on mind and self um, from basically more of a secular perspective um, so welcome to uh, join us in the series of uh, monthly abhidhamma classes by venerable bhikkhu bodhi and we're so delighted now to have venerable um, tuning in from new york and giving us his special time. Uh, what an offering to all of us um, to be able to go into depth with this material. So I turn it over to Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi. Thank you again for returning to the second session. I see somebody put a note saying, sorry, no webcam or microphone. Um, Monte, I think it's maybe because I was asking where people are logging in from. So oh, I see. They, they didn't, but we have a really wide selection, as you can see in the chat box, of all the different, you know, states uh, where people are logging in from. And so I was curious where where people were uh, situated. I see. I see. You'll see where they're from in the chat box. I see. So that just means that she can't. Maybe she can't uh, respond to well, that. She, okay. Okay, so let me share the screen and we will continue. Okay. Okay, so in the last session, I went through the 14, 14 functions of the cheetahs. And now we're going to see which cheetahs perform these functions. And here I have to clarify a particular point. And I've highlighted these, this point in the text that there is a distinction between a type of consciousness and the function after which it is commonly named. This means that certain types of consciousness are named after a single function that they perform but those types of consciousness those cheetahs can actually perform several functions and to illustrate this i'll use a analogy an easy to understand analogy let's suppose we have a man who is a medical doctor so we call him dr anderson just make up the name so his main sort of function within society is to serve as a medical doctor. But he's also married and has a wife. Maybe he has two children. And so when he's maybe going out to dinner with his family, with his wife and children, they go out to a restaurant to eat. Though, he, though we call him Dr. Anderson, but he's not functioning as a medical doctor but now he's functioning as the, a husband and a father to his wife and children. And maybe 
you know, just because he's called Dr. Anderson doesn't mean that he'll be serving his wife and children medicine at the dinner table in the restaurant. <laughs> and maybe also in his spare time, he also serves as the coach for the town Little League baseball team. And so they'll still, the young baseball players will still call him Coach Anderson or Dr. Anderson, but it doesn't mean that he's giving medicines <laughs> to the young baseball players. So his main function is to be a medical doctor. And so that's how he gets his name, Dr. Anderson. But he also has several other functions, husband, father, coach. And with the cheetah, it's somewhat similar. So the cheetah might have a particular function after which it's named, but it also will perform several other functions. So that will help us understand what is going on here when we come to which cheetahs perform which functions. And I'm going to do this, I think it's easy to do this, just by going directly to the, to the, the table that I have here. And let's get rid of the easy ones first. Okay, so we have the function of seeing. This is performed only by eye consciousness. So eye consciousness performs one function, but don't forget there are two types of eye consciousness the unwholesome resultant and the wholesome resultant. So two cheetahs perform that one function of seeing. And similarly with hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, respectively ear consciousness, nose consciousness, tongue consciousness, and body consciousness. In each case, there's just one function performed by those cheetahs. And for each of those functions, there are two kinds of cheetahs. Okay, let's take now the function of inverting. That is turning to the object. Now, there are basically two ways in which inverting takes place. When an object appears at one of the five sense faculties, the physical sense faculties, then that is the job of the five door adverting consciousness. So the five door adverting consciousness has one function, which is adverting, and there's only one cheetah that performs that function. But inverting also takes place at the mind door. This is when some inner object presents itself to the mind, like an idea appears, a thought appears, some reflection appears, a mental image appears. In that case, one is not attending to any external object, but one turns inward to focus on that mental object. So that is the function of inverting performed by a particular cheetah called the mind door inverting consciousness. And the same mind door inverting consciousness, this cheetah also has another function. Its function is determining the object at the sense door, in a sense door process. So when there's a physical object appearing at a sense door, this cheta takes on the function of determining. When it's a purely mental object appearing at the mind door, it takes on the function of mind door adverting. So the mind door adverting consciousness has two functions, but it's just one cheetah performing those two functions, but it performs the functions in different contexts. Again, this is like, who is that coaching the baseball team? 
Dr. Anderson. But I thought Dr. Anderson was a medical doctor. No, I mean, he is a medical doctor, but on Saturdays, he coaches the baseball team. Okay. Okay, so he took inverting. Now let's take investigating. So investigation is performed, this function is performed by the investigating consciousness accompanied by equanimity. And there are two types of investigating consciousness accompanied by equanimity. One is the unwholesome resultant, one is the wholesome resultant. So two cheetahs perform that function of investigating with equanimity. And there's also a wholesome resultant investigating consciousness accompanied by joy that also performs the function of investigating. And so the function of investigating is performed by three cheetahs, the two with equanimity and the one accompanied by joy. Okay, we already took determining, which is just performed by the mind or adverting consciousness. Okay, let's go to Javana. The function of Javana altogether is performed by 55 cheetahs. Of those 55, we have unwholesome, 12 unwholesome cheetahs can perform the function of Javana. And to see those 12, you have to go back to chapter one. Okay, then we have the sense fear wholesome cheetahs. Those occur in the role of Javana with the function of Javana. In the case of, of non-arahants, who engage in whole, ordinary wholesome activities. And when arhats engage in ordinary good activities, their cheetahs are the sense sphere functional cheetahs. And so we have eight wholesome and eight functional. Then the sublime what's called the sublime cheetahs are the five jhanas and the five arupas or immaterial meditative absorptions. So we have five jhanas and four immaterial absorptions. And so there are nine wholesome cheetahs performing those functions. and nine functional cheetahs performing those functions. This is when the arahats enter into any of the five jhanas or the four immaterial attainments. Their cheetahs are called sublime functional cheetahs. So five and four, so there's nine and nine, so we have 18 there. Then the super mundane, these are the four paths and four fruits. Those are eight. And so we've covered all the Javana functions, but there's one rather strange bird in this group, which is called the smiling consciousness. This is a rootless consciousness, which is said to be <laughs> the chitta that occurs that causes an arahant to smile about some ordinary events taking place. So there's only one smiling cheetah, which has that one function of causing the act of smiling. So if you add these up, then we get a total of 55. 
Okay, now registration is a rather strange um, category, strange function. So what performs the function of registration? Okay, it is the top. There are 11 cheetahs that perform the function of registration. Two of them are the same cheetahs that perform the function of investigation with equanimity. That is the unwholesome resultant and the wholesome resultant. So that's two. Then there is the type of cheetah that performs the function of investigation with joy, but that cheetah has the other function of registration. And so that's one cheetah. And then the eight kinds of sense fear, beautiful resultants, or the sense fear resultants with roots, of which there are eight, these chaitas have also have the function of registration. So eight, two, and one. So 11 chaitas have the function of registration. And so at this point, we've covered all of the chaitas that occur in the cognitive process. But now we come to the the rebirth, bhavanga, and death cheetahs. So these are the cheetahs that occur outside an active process. And remember what I said earlier, in any given existence, it's the same type of cheetah that performs the function of rebirth, bhavanga, and death. So when each of us individually, when we took rebirth, we took rebirth through a particular rebirth consciousness. And that rebirth consciousness occurred only for one moment at the very moment when the stream of consciousness arrived into our present existence. But right after that rebirth consciousness arose, arises and falls away, then it is followed by the bhavanga, the substratum consciousness, which is the same type of chitta, just with a different function. And this chitta continues on through the course of life whenever there's no active consciousness occurring. And then at the very end of the life, the last moment of consciousness before the life process, before the life comes to an end, that is the death consciousness. And that is the same type of chitta as the rebirth and bhavanga chitta. So what are the chittas that perform these three functions? Again, we have this type of chitta, which is named the investigating chitta accompanied by equanimity. And in the case of beings reborn in the three lower realms of existence, in the hells, the realm of the ghosts or spirits, the animal realm, the rebirth bhavanga death consciousness is the unwholesome How do we call this? The unwholesome resultant investigating consciousness accompanied by equanimity. But it's not performing the function of investigation, but the functions of rebirth, bhavanga, and death. Now, in the case of human beings, it said, who are congenitally, that is by the very nature of the rebirth consciousness, are determined to be blind from birth, deaf from birth, or to have some other congenital disability, the rebirth consciousness is the wholesome resultant investigating consciousness accompanied by equanimity. 
So it's a wholesome resultant because human existence is always the result of wholesome karma, but it's a rather weak wholesome karma that doesn't have roots. Okay, in the case of other human rebirths or rebirth in the lower heavenly realms, the heavenly realms of the sense sphere, the cheetahs that take on the role of rebirth, bhavanga, and death are the sense sphere, the beautiful sense sphere resultants, the sense sphere revolt resultants with roots, with beautiful roots, which can be two roots or three roots. And the most desirable kind of rebirth consciousness is the one with three roots, because that rebirth consciousness will have the root of wisdom or knowledge. And so it's the three-rooted resultant consciousness that has the potential for attaining the higher stages of, of samadhi and the higher stages of wisdom and for attain, attaining the super mundane, the world transcending states of consciousness. If one is reborn with two good roots, non-greed and non-delusion, but one lacks the root of non-greed non and non-hatred, but if one lacks the root of non-delusion or the root of wisdom, one could engage in wholesome activities, but one can't reach the jhanas, the formless meditations, or the world transcend attainments. Okay, so taking the total, so here we have two types of investigating consciousness with equanimity. So two here, two cheetahs here. Oh, I didn't, I didn't do the sublime. Okay, now for those beings reborn in the <clears throat> in the form realm or the fine material realm. <clears throat> they are reborn at the five level of the five jhanas or at the level of the four in the four formless planes of existence. So they're reborn in the planes of the form realm that correspond to the five jhanas or in the formless immaterial plane corresponding to the four immaterial attainments. And so there are nine, and they are reborn with their, the resultant of their respective meditative attainment as their rebirth, bhavanga, and death, chitta. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> Okay, so I'm starting to get a hoarse voice again. <clears throat> Let me just get my, my drink that will dissolve the flood. <laughs> Okay, suppose we have, say, a meditator who attains, let's say, the first jhana as a human being, and they preserve that jhanic attainment at the time of death. It doesn't mean that they have to die in the jhana, but they still have continued from time to time to practice the first jhana. So when they pass away and take rebirth, they will get reborn in with a sublime chitta, the, the first jhana resultant chitta, similarly with the other jhana chittas. And then suppose we have a meditator who masters, let's say, the base of infinite consciousness, the second immaterial meditative absorption. Okay, when they pass away, then they will be reborn 
in the in the sphere of infinite consciousness and their rebirth bhavanga consciousness will be the resultant consciousness corresponding to the base of infinite consciousness Okay, so we have nine resultant chetas. And so in this way, we have, we've already taken the two investigating chetas performing the role of rebirth, bhavanga, death, eight sense fear resultants, and then nine sublime resultants, five jhanas, four immaterial attainments. So that makes the total of 19. And so that takes us through, I think, all of the functions of the cheetah, the functions of the cheetahs and the different cheetahs that perform those functions. So maybe I should take some questions at this point. Any questions on the yes, functions? Sir. Thank you. Um, so, are there just a number of questions. Um, are in, when investigating consciousness is called wholesome or unwholesome, what is the difference? Isn't it just one consciousness? Okay, first, the investigating consciousness itself is neither wholesome nor unwholesome, but it's wholesome resultant or unwholesome resultant, which means the result of the wholesome or result of the unwholesome. And the difference is in the nature of the object that's being investigated. So in the process of consciousness, let me go to that other table. Okay, so we could see here, an object comes into range of the eye. So we have the five door adverting, eye consciousness receiving, investigating and determining. Okay, if it's an disagreeable, if, if it's an unwholesome karma that's going to mature, then a disagreeable object will come into range of the eye. And so the I consciousness, the receiving, the investigating will be cheetahs that are results of the unwholesome karma. And they will be cognizing a disagreeable or unpleasant object. On the other hand, if it's a wholesome karma that is about to ripen, then the object that appears into the range of the eye will be an agreeable or pleasant object. And the eye consciousness, the receiving and investigating cheetahs will be wholesome resultant cheetahs. Thank you, Bhante. Yeah, so, so it's the object that determines the difference in the eye consciousness, receiving consciousness and investigating consciousness. So this relates to a second question, which is, are cheetahs states of mind or functions of mind? It, it would seem to me those are distinct, those are distinct from one another. Maybe I should say that the cheetah is an act of mind, which performs a function. It, it's just, I mean, just to use your metaphor of the baseball guy, if the doctor is coaching a good baseball player and a bad baseball player, he's still just a baseball coach. So the, yeah. the wholesome unwholesome doesn't seem to work in that metaphor. In a sense, that, that, that state argument that he's an unwholesome or a wholesome coach, depending on whether he's got a good or a bad player, but he's still a coach yeah. in either case. Yeah, I, I don't think we should push analogies too far. Yeah. Uh, I use that analogy just to show that just as one man can perform several functions or one person can perform several functions, 
one chitta can perform several functions. And so the chitta, let's say the chitta is defined as such by the particular group of mental factors that constitute that chitta and by its role in the cognitive process. But then that chitta has particular functions and one chitta can have several functions. So the constitution, the bundle or package of mental factors in that chitta will be the same, say, for this chitta when it's performing the function of rebirth, bhavanga, death, and the function of investigating and the function of registering, registration, the bundle of mental factors is the same. So that's, for that reason, we call it the same chitta or same type of chitta, but it's performing different functions. I see, thank you, Bhante. Um, then a third question here, can you change rebirth consciousness as the Hindus try to do I, the last moment of consciousness is what determines your rebirth. Okay, strictly speaking, it's not the death consciousness that determines the nature of one's rebirth, but it's the, the process of consciousness preceding death. It's called the death proximate process. That is a karmically active process which plays a major role in determining the nature of the rebirth. The death chitta is just, I call it a sign off chitta. It just sort of signals end to this lifespan. I compare it, I use an analogy to illustrate this death chitta. It's like when you're watching a movie at the very end of the movie, when the movie is finished, then there appears the words, the end, and maybe a little bit of music, bum, ba, bum, and then the sign, the end. So the words, the end is not part of the film. It's not part of the story. <laughs> but it's just a way of signaling the movie is over. And so the death consciousness is just a way of signaling just for one moment, the life is over. But what is going to govern the rebirth process in the next life are the karmically active chitas that are occurring close to the event of death. Right. Um, and then Bhante, um, someone's request a clarification. Restlessness is caused by delusion. Can you please elaborate on this? Let's say restlessness is rooted in delusion. Um, it's just that, okay, restlessness itself as a quality is present in all unwholesome cheetahs. So all cheetahs rooted in greed, cheetahs rooted in hatred, also have some kind of rest restlessness underlying them. But there is this one particular cheetah in which there's no greed, no hatred, but maybe we could say that there's a heavy amount of strong ripples and waves of restlessness. And so that kind of restlessness in which there's no greed, no aversion is still rooted in delusion because restlessness is an unwholesome mental factor and delusion or ignorance is the underlying root of all unwholesome mental states. Thank you, Dante. There's a question here. What is the mindedness, thinking and volitions of an arhat to be and stay free of karma while interacting daily with life and others in the mode of inherent service or goodness and smiling with joy? Is, is, repeat the question. Yes, it's a slightly strange question. What is the thinking, let's say, and volition of an arhat okay. to be free and stay free of karma while interacting daily with yeah. life and others in the mode of inherent goodness. Okay, okay, okay. The chitas of an arhat, when we look at that, well, maybe we don't see them from the outside, but when we look at the activities of an arhat, we would say that they're good activities. And we would even maybe say that they're wholesome activities. But in the Abhidhamma system, the dis, dis, the dis, the distinguishing feature of the wholesome 
is the creation of karma. It's not so much a moral evaluation, but it's the capacity to create karma, karma which will continue into a future existence and produce its results. And the production of karma depends upon whether good or bad karma depends on the presence of the underlying latent defilements. So even in the wholesome cheetahs of the sense fear cheetahs, let's say wholesome cheetahs, there's still in latent form ignorance and craving. And so our good activities create wholesome karma with the ability to ripen in the future and produce desirable results. But in the case of the arhat, there's no more ignorance, no more craving. So, so he engages in good activities, but that those activities no longer have the capacity to create karma. Thank you, Bhante. Uh, is this why an arhat has cheetahs that are unassociated with knowledge? What I would, I think probably the cheetahs and the arhat dissociated from knowledge, maybe, I don't know, maybe, I just have to speculate, maybe if he's just walking down the road, you know, there's no special need to be activating knowledge and understanding on that occasion. He would be doing so, I guess, with mindfulness, but not making an effort to understand anything particularly, or maybe brushing the teeth, taking a shower, Again, doing it with mindfulness, but perhaps no active function of gaining insight or understanding. So there are those cheetahs, even in the arhat, dissociated from knowledge. So how does an arhat distinguish between good and bad? Oh, he has that, certainly that capacity. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, of course, I would say even stronger, more clearer than an ordinary person able to consider because there is no more screen of delusion and wrong views. So what's ethically good and bad is very clear to him. It's just that his activities don't create, his own activities, his or her activities, don't create any karma. Ah, thank you. Um, there's a question here. Why are the sense sphere on wholesome cheetahs, the 12, uh, why do they not have a counterpart of their, in their resultant che uh, cheetahs? Uh, that's a good question. And it's an interesting question. Um, and all I could do is provide the answer that the Abhidhamma system gives, the Abhidhamma te teaches. I have to say it's not completely convincing to me, but I give the answer that the unwholesome cheetahs, <laughs> believe it or not, are said to be relatively weak, weak, weak in comparison to the wholesome cheetahs. And so the unwholesome cheetahs, their results will only be rootless resultants. They don't produce rooted resultants. But the wholesome cheetahs, the sense we are wholesome cheetahs, because they have roots, they are stronger and so they produce um, resultants that correspond to themselves. Hmm. That's the answer to figure. Thank you, Bhante. I mean, I have to admit, when I'm told that the unwholesome cheetahs are weak compared to the wholesome cheetahs, <laughs> I sometimes say in my mind, really? <laughs> then why? Are they apparently controlling the world? <laughs> and then, Bundy, there's a question here. I did, um, you said uh, without the wisdom root, jhana is not possible. Is that a, a correct understanding? For somebody whose rebirth consciousness, say, has the sense fear resultant rebirth consciousness with two roots, without the root of non delusion, then this is what they say, then it's not possible for them to attain the jhanas or the formless or the immaterial attainments or the super mundane cheetahs. 
because that requires the root of wisdom, the non-delusion. But of course, they should practice. They should, you know, practice meditation, aiming at the jhanas. So even if they don't succeed, but in undertaking the practice, they are building up the potential for gaining a three-rooted rebirth consciousness through which they can attain. Okay. So when you engage like an activity like developing a meditation subject, that would be a sense fear wholesome chitta in the javana stage with three roots. And so that would have the tendency, if it takes on the role of generating rebirth, to produce a rebirth consciousness with three roots. I see. And in fact, there's a, a question relating to this. If one is reborn with only two roots. Um, Wait, I had the headphones up. Okay. Sorry. Uh, there's a related question. If one is reborn with only two roots, obtaining the appropriate results for that, is it not possible to develop in this life the third root? Yeah, exactly. That's what oh. I just explained. Oh, that's what I thought. Yeah, thank you. Um, then there's a question here, Bhante. What is the cheetah that creates weird perceptions, visions while meditating? Is, would that be rooted and unwholesome? cheetah which is being suppressed what's causing that phenomenon yeah i haven't seen that question dealt with in the abhidhamma so i would just have to speculate and i don't know how to answer it easily within the good scheme of the cheetahs laid out in the abhidhamma right Thank but you. one would probably say that these are Probably we say that these are like impressions maybe that have been stored up, I would have to say in the bhavanga, which are sort of bubbling up from the bhavanga into active consciousness in the meditative process. Yes. And then okay. what gives cheetah power to cause effects? What is the power of the cheetah? In this case of the karmically active cheetahs, the cheetahs that create karma, it would be probably the mental factor of volition, which in Pali, the Pali word is chaitana. Because chaitana volition is the, it's the, um, it's the, it's the major factor in creating karma. So that is what I would say is what uh, is responsible for the jet for generating the karma in the karmically active cheetahs is that fa that uh, factor that mental factor of chaitanya or volition. Thank you, Bhante. And then there's two final questions: Does an arhat always have an uh, have wholesome actions, or is he or she free from that distinction? I think I dealt with that. The of course, arhats do things like they, they do sleep. <laughs> and when they're sleeping, then there would be, I guess the, the mind will go into the bhavanga state, into deep dreamless sleep. Um, so that's not wholesome. But say when they're going about their ordinary activities, it would be, it would be doing so with the sense fear functional cheetahs. And then when they go into, if they go into a meditative state, it would be with the sublime functional cheetahs, either into the jhanas or the immaterial attainments. Or if they go into the fruition attainment, then they will be doing so with the fruition, the arahat pala chitta, the fruit of arahat consciousness. Okay. And then Bhante, there's only two more questions. One is, um, could there be senses outside the usual five senses in different kinds of beings, for example, birds, sensing magnetic fields would imply? I would, I, in my opinion, definitely so. But the Abhidhamma doesn't speak about them because I think it's concerned with the experience, was based on the experience of human beings, but it also speaks about the experience of devas and brahmas, beings in higher realms. But it seems to me like insects will have other senses that we're not familiar with. <laughs> and maybe maybe if an insect were to uh, 
compose its own Abhidhamma system, it would take account of insect sense faculties, not human sense faculties. <laughs> and then finally, Bhante, an awful lot of the Abhidhamma, I mean, more than half of the classification appears to be related to jhana states. Um, and so the question arises, how does understanding the Abhidhamma help with practice? Does it imply that jhana practice is required for this system to really have purchase? Or, I mean, what is it? Yeah, I think that's a maybe a question that's not so relevant to this right now. That would be more relevant to what I'm, I'll deal with when we come to chapter nine. And I, I don't think it's quite true to say that half the Abhidhamma system is concerned with jhanic states. But I mean, jhanic states are taken into account because that's part of the meditative experience. But you see that it covers all sorts of experience, sensory experience, passive sensory experience, active, ordinary day-to-day -day experience, as well as jhanic experience and world transcending realization. So they're all taken into account. Thank you, Bhante. That was great. Okay. Thank yeah. you very much for clearing all the questions. Okay, now it's time to move on from functions. Let's see how to do this. Now. I have to rotate. Uh, okay, now the next section we come to is called doors. So what is meant by the doors? The doors are basically the sense faculties through which you can see here with the media through which the mind interacts with the objective world. There are three doors of action, but we're not going to be dealing with them here. But what we're concerned with are six doors of cognition. These are the six sense doors by which the chitta together with its mental factors, the chaitasikas, go out to meet the object. So you can see them as doors, as exits, through which the chitta goes out to meet the object. Or we could see them as entrances, doors through which objects enter into the range of the chitta and chaitasikas. And there are six sense doors. The six sense doors are the eye door, ear door, nose door, tongue door, body door, and mind door. And here it says the eye itself is the eye door and so for the ear door and the others. But here one has to be a little more specific. What is meant by the eye that serves as the eye door, I think I specify it here, is a special kind of material, uh, material substance, which is called sensitive matter. So in each of the five sense organs, there is a sensitive matter, a kind of matter that can respond to the corresponding type of object. So what we mean by the eye is not the entire physical organ that we call the eye, but some some place within this eye, maybe we say in the retina, there's a kind of material substance that responds to light and color. So that is the eye door, maybe corresponding in today's terminology to the rods and cones in the retina. And what's meant by the ear as a door is not this flappy thing out here, but inside there's an organ or tissue which is sensitive to sound, to vibrations in terms of vibrations of the ear into sounds. And similarly, the nose is not this thing sticking out here, but up inside the nostrils there will be some tissue that is able to pick up molecules and turn them into the 
perce perceptions of smells. And what's meant by the tongue would be, maybe this would correspond to the taste buds over the tongue, those particular cells that can pick up different tastes. And then throughout the body, both externally on the skin and also on the inner organs, there is matter that is sensitive to tactile sensations. That is the body door. And then the mind door is, those five are material or physical. The mind door is mental. And namely, the mind door is the bhavanga chitta. Because when an object is to be cognized by a mind door process, not through the physical senses, but by turning inward to take account of, an, for example, an idea, a thought, to be aware of one's own emotions, or even abstract thinking, mathematical formulas, and so forth then the cheetahs belonging to that process gain object, gain access to the object through the mind door without immediate dependence on a material sense faculty. And now let's see how cheetahs arise through the doors. And so we're starting off with the eye door and I'm, go I'm going to, again, split the screen and then take the table and the text simultaneously. Do -do. Let me see, it's already split. Okay, so the text tells us 46 types, the 46 cheetahs arise in the eye door according to circumstances. So what are these cheetahs? We have the five door inverting. So a visible form has become, has arrived. And now the mental process, the five door inverting cheetah arises turning to that form. Then there occurs the eye consciousness. Then there comes the receiving, the investigating, which might be with equanimity or in the case of a very pleasant object with joy. Then there comes the determining chitta through the eye door. And then there will come sense fear javanas. So this will be, it could be any of the 12 unwholesome chetas occurring in the javana with the javana function, or it could be the eight sense fear, uh, the, the eight be beautiful rooted chetas, the eight wholesome rooted chetas occurring with the function of javana. And then they can occur the cheetahs with red, the function of registration. That would be sense fear resultants or the investigating consciousness. So if we add them up, there's 46 here. Maybe I don't have to lose, <laughs> lose the time take, taking these totals, but basically I think you can get the picture from this 
So these are the chitas that arise through the eye door, ear door the same. The only thing that differs is the, the sensory consciousness from eye consciousness to ear consciousness. And so through nose, tongue, and body. Now with the mind in the mind door, so with the mind door, we don't have any of these preliminary chitas. But the mind door process begins with a mind door. When an object is appearing at the mind door, the process starts with the mind door adverting chitta, which is then followed immediately by the javana phase. And in the sense sphere, it could be followed by the registration chitas. Okay, so in the mind door, we have 67 chitas arise. Mind door adverting, then any of the 55 javanas can occur through the mind door. Through the mind door, yeah, this is maybe important. The The sublime javanas, that is, when one goes into the jhanas and the formless meditations, those chitas, those chitas occur only through the mind door. They don't occur through the physical sense doors. So a meditator goes into a jhana, the chitas in the jhana process are always occurring through the mind door, not through a sense door. And similarly, if he goes into a Immaterial attainment, it goes into the base of infinite space, infinite consciousness. It's occurring only through the mind door. And similarly, the super mundane uh, state chitas, the attainment of the paths of realization and the fruits occur only in the mind door. And so there are many more chitas occurring through the mind door than through the physical sense doors. Okay, so through the five door inverting, we can see how many doors these cheetahs are going through. Or well, maybe I finish this. I do the, do, those cheetahs that are freed from doors. This is a designation for the rebirth, bhavanga, and death cheetahs. Since those cheetahs occur below the threshold of active consciousness, they occur at what I call the substratum level. And so those are door freed and the cheetahs that occur freed from doors would be the 19 cheetahs that take on the role of rebirth linking, bhavanga and death. The investigating chitta accompanied by equanimity, whether unwholesome resultant or wholesome resultant. The sense fear, the eight, great sense fear resultants, the sublime resultants, Oops. yeah, the sublime resultants, Yeah, the, the sublime resultants don't occur through any doors. So they're always door freed because the sublime resultants, those are the results of the jhanas or immaterial attainments. And those chitas only have the role of rebirth linking, bhavanga and death consciousness. They don't have any other function. So they are completely door freed. Okay, so the five door adverting consciousness can occur through five doors. Eye consciousness through body consciousness occurs only through one door, but each of those chitas can be either 
unwholesome resultant or wholesome resultant. So there's two of each type. The receiving consciousness can occur through any of the five doors that receives the form, it receives a sound, an odor, a taste, or a tactile sensation. So it occurs through the five doors, but it can be unwholesome resultant or wholesome resultant. So two cheetahs. The investigating consciousness can occur through six doors, either at the five physical sense doors or else when it's taking on the role of registration, it be, can be occurring at the mind door. And so it occurs through the six doors and similarly, the investigating consciousness accompanied by joy can occur when investigating any of the five sense objects or as registration occurring in the mind door. So it occurs through six doors. The determining consciousness will occur as through five sense doors when determining a sense object. And when occurring in the mind door, it occurs as the mind door adverting consciousness. And it's only one chitta performing these two functions. So it occurs at six doors. The sense sphere javanas can occur through any of the six doors, five physical sense doors or in the mind door. The sublime, that's the jhanic and super mundane javanas occur only through the mind door. And the sense sphere resultants can occur through the six doors, that is when they occur as as the registration consciousness through any of the six sense doors. But when they take on the role of rebirth, bhavanga, or death, then they are occurring more free. And so we have them occurring through six doors. And the sublime resultants are necessarily, there are nine chitas which occur freed of doors. So I think that covers all of the chitas occurring through the doors. Let's see anything. Okay, we don't need so much detail. Yeah, I think if you want to get all of the detail, then you can re <laughs> read the book on your own, but if I were to go into full detail, then it would just take too much time and I want to leave time at the end for questions. Okay, now we move to another important topic. This is in a way the counterpart to the doors. This is the compendium of objects. So in the compendium of objects, there are six kinds of objects. So there's the visible form, sounds, smells or odors, tastes, the tangible or tactile object, and then the purely mental object. So a visible form is the visible form object, and so with the other physical sense objects. But the one which is a little bit complicated is the mental object. So I said that the mental object is sixfold. And so one type of mental object is sensitive matter. So what is sensitive matter? Sensitive matter, I just explained, it's the <coughs> type of matter in the sense faculties that is sensitive to the corresponding types of objects. For example, as I mentioned, the sensitive matter of the eye, that sensitive matter of the eye can't be seen, heard, smelled, tasted, or touched, but it performs its function. And so it's known by inference from the fact that we see forms that there is that sensitive matter there. So it's a purely mental object. Okay, then subtle matter, 
there are various types of subtle matter which are mentioned in the Abhidhamma to give just a few examples. One would be the type of material phenomena in this Abhidhamma system, which is responsible for one's gender determination. Maybe in modern terms, this would correspond to the chromosomes that determine one as male or female. So that is one type of subtle matter. So it has to be known by inference. It can't be perceived through the senses. Another type of subtle matter is said to be the life faculty. The faculty is responsible for sustaining our life. Another type of subtle matter is the it's called nutritive essence. It's the nutri, maybe it would correspond to things like, in modern terms, vitamins and minerals and proteins, the nutrients that sustain the body. So though that's not, those things are not objects of sensory perception, but they're known inferentially. So we have sensitive matter, subtle matter, then the chitta itself, the consciousness, we have to know that we don't know our consciousness through by seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, or touching, but we know it through the mind itself, through reflection. So the chitta is a mental object. And we also can become aware of our mental factors. We know when we're angry. We know when we're greedy. We know when we are peaceful, we know when we are being generous, we know when we have kindness, we know when we have compassion, so we, we know when we are being mindful, and so we have these, a knowledge of our own factors of mind, so that is a mental object. Then also Nibbana, the unconditioned state, has to be known through the mind through the mind door. It's not known through the physical senses. And then concepts, this would be all sorts of ideas, judgments, propositions, notions, and so forth. So those are the six types of mental objects. Of the six kinds, the first five are included in the category of rupa, materiality. So we have visible form, sound, smell, and taste. These are considered to be kinds of derived matter. The tangible object is identified with the primary elements, actually three of the primary elements. The earth element, which is experienced by touch as hardness or softness. The fire element, which is experienced as heat or cold and the air element, which is experienced as pressure or expansion and contraction. It's said that the fourth primary element, the water element, has the characteristic of cohesion. And so this is considered another type of subtle matter, which has to be known through the mind door, not by touch. But this is a point I have to confess where I disagree with the Abhidhamma. Because it seems to me that the water element should have the characteristic of wetness. And wetness is a distinct property, distinct from heat or cold. And one could feel wetness with, with the body. So it seems to me that the water element is also an object of the tactile sense. Okay, we've gone through the mental object. Okay, just to Okay, for eye consciousness, for eye door consciousness, all of the chitas that arise through the eye door, visible form is the object in the present. And so sounds are the object of all of the chitas that arise through the ear door. And similarly, with 
odors. That is the object of all the chitas that arise through the nose door. Tastes are the object of all the chitas that arise through the tongue door. The tactile object is the object of all of the chitas that arise through the body door. And they can be known as objects only when they are present. Okay, the object of the mind door consciousness is of the six kinds mentioned. And those objects might be present, but they can also be past or future or independent of time. For example, Nibbana is said to be non-temporal, but it can be known through the mind door. We can know past events when we remember things that occurred in the past. We can entertain future objects, objects pertaining to the future, when we imagine things that might happen in the future. So all of that is occurring through the mind door. I'm going to skip the details here, which gets rather complicated. So it's enough to get a general sense. But what I want to just dwell on a little bit are the objects of the last cognitive process in the immediately preceding life. Because it is the last cognitive process in any given life that determines the rebirth consciousness, the bhavanga, and death consciousness in the following existence. So the text says, when, an, when a person is on the verge of death, in the last phase of active consciousness, some object will present itself to the, to the cognitive process. And that object, what object appears will be determined by previous karma and by present circumstances. And this object can be of three kinds. It can be a karma itself. That is some good or bad deed that we've performed in the course of our lifetime can suddenly present itself at the mind door. So say a person who's practiced a lot of generosity, making offerings, say, going to monasteries and making offerings of dana to the monks. When they're about to pass away, that karma, that recollection of that act of making the offering to the monks or to the nuns will present itself to the mind or in that cognitive process. A person who's done a lot of bad deeds, let's say a person who's worked slaughtering animals, that's been their professional work, so they're always killing animals. And so when the death process is, even though they've may, maybe been retired for 10 years, but that strong karma of killing, so when the death process is occurring, then the karma of taking life, of killing, repeatedly killing animals, will appear during that last cognitive process. So that is the karma that appears. An alternative object that can appear is called the sign of karma. And this is an object or image associated with the good or bad deed that is going to determine rebirth or an instrument used to perform it. For example, the devout person, maybe they will have an image will appear of a stupa or dagaba. Dagaba is a Sinhalese word, a chaitya or a stupa or an image of a Maybe they'll see a group of monks, or maybe they'll have an image of the Buddha will appear. This is in the case of a Buddhist. Maybe a Christian will have an image of Jesus or an image of Mary, a Roman Catholic, or saints. 
a physician may see the image of their patients for medicines and so forth. And the butcher may hear the groans of the slaughtered cattle or see the image of a butcher knife. So that would be an object or an image associated with the good or bad deed. Then the third kind of object that appears is called the sign of destiny. And this is a symbol of the realm into which the dying person is about to be reborn. And so this, I've actually heard cases of this reported of people who were about to die and then they didn't die, but they came back to life. So a person who has done like a lot of good deeds, good but mundane deeds, so they're heading for a heavenly rebirth. And so they might have images of celestial mansions or an image of angels coming to greet them. Or a Buddhist might have, especially a Pure Land Buddhist, might have an image of Amitabha Buddha coming to welcome them to the Pure Land or Kuan Yin Bodhisattva coming to welcome them. So they see a some kind of sign of their future destiny, in this case, a good destiny. But say the person has done a lot of bad deeds, accumulated heavy, unwholesome karma, so they're heading for a rebirth in hell. So they may see the fires, intense fires, and might start maybe to feel the heat of those fires, where they might see devilish beings, you know, with pointy ears and long tails and with spears and knives coming to them with hideous expressions on their faces. Or if they're heading for an animal rebirth, they might see signs that, that indicate an animal existence. So this becomes the object during the last, say, in the cognitive processes building up to the event of death. And there can be changes taking place. I've heard about this. I remember a story that I heard of a person who was dying, getting close to death, and he started to see bad signs. I don't remember exactly what they were maybe infernal fires, or maybe signs of a rebirth in the ghostly realm. And then he reported that to his relatives. His relatives went to the nearby Buddhist temple and called a, an eminent monk to come. And the eminent monk came and did some recitation and gave some advice, some guidance to the person who was about to pass, it, was it, who was undergo, getting close to death. And when the person heard the words and chanting of the monk, then his mind calmed down and the monk would have reminded him of his good deeds. And so the person started to think of his good deeds and then good signs started to appear like signs of a heavenly mansion. And he passed away peacefully and presumably he had a happy rebirth. Okay, so these are some of the highlights on the chapter of the section on objects. Again, I'm not going to go into all of the details. Yeah, there's a table which shows which cheetahs take which kind of objects. It's very detailed. But I want to take the last subsection here, which is called the Compendium of Bases. And the Pali word here is Vatu. 
And now we can see in the text speaks about the summary of bases. There are six bases. So the six bases are the eye base, ear base, nose base, tongue base, body base, and heart base. And now it's necessary to make an important distinction. Yes, here. Okay, so first, what is meant by a base, a vatu? The base is a physical support for the occurrence of consciousness, for the occurrence of the chittas. And now this is the important qualification. The first five bases coincide with the first five do doors. So the first five bases are eye, ear, nose, tongue, body. Eye, ear, nose, tongue, and body. And the first five doors are the same, the sensitive matter of the five sense faculties. But a base is not identical with a door because it plays a different role in relation to the origination of consciousness. The door is a channel through which the chittas and chaitasikas in a cognitive process gain access to the object. Whereas a base is a physical support for the occurrence of the chittas and chaitasikas. Now, a conse this, the consequence of this, okay, in an eye door process, I'm taking the eye door as an example, many types of chittas, apart from eye consciousness, occur with the eye faculty or eye sensitive matter as their door. So we saw earlier, in an eye door process, I have this table still here. In an eye door process, we have the five door adverting consciousness occurs there, the eye consciousness occurs, the receiving, the investigating, with either with equanimity or joy the sense sphere, the determining consciousness, the sense sphere javanas, and the registration chitas, which are sense sphere resultants. All of these are occurring through the eye door. And similarly with ear, nose, tongue, and body door, with just the appropriate changes. Okay, but the Eye sensitivity is the base only for eye consciousness, not for the other chittas that arise through the eye door. Because the defining characteristic of the base is that it is a physical support for the occurrence of a chitta. And so, I want to get now the table of bases. I think we have to turn straight. Okay, so this table will show us which chitas arise through which bases. So first, we, we'll take care of the easy ones first, then we'll get to the more difficult ones. Okay, the eye base, this is the eye sensitivity, is the base only for eye consciousness. And so there are two types of eye consciousness, 
unwholesome resultant, wholesome resultant. And so we have two chitas arising through the eye base. And similarly for ear base, nose base, tongue base, and body base. Each of these sensitive matter of these five organs is the base only for the two types of chitas, unwholesome resultant and wholesome resultant, that arise with that particular type of matter as its physical support. Now comes the comp more complicated issue, and maybe I should take the text to clarify this. For, this is called the heart base, and according to the Abhidharma commentaries, the heart base is a particular type of subtle matter that occurs in the region of the heart. It's not the heart organ itself, but it's a subtle kind of matter that occurs in the region of the heart that serves as the physical support for states, for chitas, states of consciousness that are not arising based on the physical sense organs. So let's say what, okay, the chitas that arise in these spaces. Okay, the five elements of sense consciousness are entirely dependent on the five sensitive parts of the sense organs as their respective bases. Those are the five we've already dealt with. Okay, now we have something called the mind element. This is the five door inverting chitta. Where is that? Uh, yeah, the mind door, the five door adverting chitta, and the two types of receiving consciousness, unwholesome resultant, wholesome resultant, collectively they are called the mind element, the mano datu. And those three chittas always arise dependent on the heart. So they always occur based on the heart basis. Similarly, the investigating consciousness, the great resultants, those are the sense sphere resultant chitas. These chitas always occur based on the heart base. The two chitas that are accompanied by aversion or by hatred always occur on the basis of the heart base. The reason why they always occur on the ba uh, based on the heart base is because the two types of hating consciousness occur only in the sense sphere. They don't occur in the fine material sphere and they don't occur in the immaterial sphere. And so the hatred rooted cheetahs, you see them here, the two cheetahs rooted in hatred always occur based on the heart basis. Okay, the first path consciousness. This is the path of stream entry. The first stage of enlightenment always occurs based on the heart base. And this is because the first path consciousness, the path of stream entry can only be reached either in the sense sphere or the sense the sensory plane of existence or in the fine material plane of existence. It cannot be attained in the immaterial plane of existence by the immaterial being.
beings, the beings without any physical matter. Why is that? Because in order to attain stream entry, you have to hear the Dhamma. You have to learn the Dhamma by hearing it from others, from somebody else. And how do you hear the Dhamma? You have to hear it with the ear. And so the first path consciousness can only arise in the sensory plane of existence or the fine material plane of existence. And so it will arise, always arise based on the hot base. But once a person becomes a stream enterer, they can be reborn if they gain the formless meditations, they can be reborn in the immaterial plane of existence without any physical body. And then they can go on to attain <laughs> the second path, third path, and fourth path without any physical body and reach liberation, nirvana, from the formless realm. How that happens, don't ask me. I don't know. But this is just what is said. Okay, the smiling consciousness arises based on the heart because you need a physical body in order to smile. And fine material sphere consciousness, that is the 15 states, that is the five jhanas, the wholesome jhanas, the five resultant cheetahs, that is the jhana cheetahs that take place as rebirth bhavanga consciousness in the fine material sphere, and the five jhana cheetahs of an arhat always occur based on the heart because they depend upon physical matter. So those always occur in dependence on the heart. Okay, the remaining classes, the remaining cheetahs, whether wholesome, unwholesome, functional, or super mundane, may be either dependent on or independent of the heart base. So this is because okay, we'll go through the table. The, the cheetahs rooted in greed can arise in beings in the immaterial sphere of existence. So in that case, so the beings without any physical body could still have a attachment, I don't know to what, but maybe they have attachment to the peace and tranquility of their meditative absorptions. And then they have that greed for that. And so cheetahs rooted in greed arise in the immaterial planes of existence and in the immaterial planes, no heart base. So the greed cheetahs arise there. Um, the cheetah with restlessness and the cheetah with doubt can also arise among the formless beings, the immaterial beings, and in that case, no heart base. When they arise in human beings, then they arise based on the heart. Okay, the mind or adverting chitta can arise without any dependence on the heart when the immaterial beings are about to go into a meditative absorption. And so the sense fear wholesome chittas, I guess, can arise in the formless realms of existence sense fear functional cheetahs can arise there and immaterial sphere wholesome cheetahs arise there and the immaterial um, sphere functional cheetahs can arise in the immaterial plane of existence. In that case, no dependence on the heart. And I think the other super mundane cheetahs also can arise in the immaterial plane of existence. So when these cheetahs arise in the sensory plane of existence and in the fine material plane of existence, they are based on the heart. But when they arise in the immaterial plane of existence, they don't depend on the heart. 
and then the immaterial sphere resultant chitas, those are the rebirth, bhavanga, and death chitas of the beings in the immaterial plane of existence. <laughs> and those beings don't have any physical body, so there's no heart there, so they don't depend, they can't arise based on the heart base. So I think maybe that should suffice to cover our survey of the bases. <laughs> and now, believe it or not, we've covered the material in chapter three. <laughs> and so now I think I can leave the rest of the session open to questions. And any, on, it could be on any of the topics that I've covered today. And they're all quite intricately interwoven. Thank you, Bante. Well, there are a number of questions. I'm sure more will come in too. Um, how do we understand color blindness in this Abhidharma process of cheetah functioning? Okay, with color blindness, of course, a person is able to see, and so they will have the eye base, they'll have the eye faculty, or the eye base, and the eye base can register incoming forms, impinging forms, and send them off to the receiving cheetah, the investigating cheetah, and so on. And everything else can arise in response to the forms that are appearing at the eye base. It's just that within the eye base, there are There's just something sort of lacking that permits the for us to the, the person to receive the great variety of colors. You know, so there's no real problem. And the Abhidhamma doesn't give any explanation of this. I guess to explain it, you would just turn to modern science of ophthalmology or optometry. Yes. Um, secondly, Banti, um just more about this issue of energy. There seems to be some energy that pushes the cheetah to the object. What is that energy? I guess this is adverting cheetah. There seems to be some energy that pushes the cheetah um, like magnetic energy or something like that. Is that a, a proper understanding? I think one would say that it's not an energy as such, but it is just inherent in the function of the inverting chitta to turn to the object when it impinges. Um, again, to use the simile, it's like the guardian of a hall with five doors and somebody knocks at one of the five doors and the guard just turns to the door from which the knocks are coming. Maybe you could say it's an energy, but I think the main factor here is just the function of that chitta is to turn to the sense door. Thank you, Bhante. Um, in terms of the five skandhas, is the sensitive substance at the door what is called rupa skanda? Yeah, the sensitive substance within each of the five sense faculties belongs to the rupa kanda or skanda. Yes. It's not the entirety. The rupa skanda includes many components. Um, right. There are the four primary elements, the five types of sensitive matter, the types of matter that represent the object, and then various others. We're going to come to that when we come to chapter six. But okay. certainly, the matter of the sense faculties belongs to the rupa kanda or Thank skanda. You. And then a similar vein, are the doors the ayatanas and are the objects the datus in the classic mm. way of analyzing? To make it simple, let's say yes. There might be some subtle qualifications, but basically you could say 
Yeah, that the doors are the ayatanas and the objects, the datus. Well, actually there's 18 datus. The 18 datus are six of them are the objects. Six of them are, well, five are the sense organs, which are, then become the same as the ayatanas. But then there's the manodatu, which in the Theravada Abhidhamma, the manodatu is the mind element, which includes these three chittas, five door inverting, and the two types of receiving consciousness. Then all of the other chittas are included within the manovinyana datu. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, in fact, just I was going to point out that um, I think within this chapter, I have a classification of the chittas. Here we have the seven consciousness elements. So the I consciousness element, this is the chakku vinyana datu, includes I, the two types of I consciousness, the air con similarly with air consciousness element, nose conscious element, tongue consciousness element, body conscious element, each is the two types of consciousness. But the mind element is the five door adverting and the two types of receiving consciousness. So we have three cheetahs, it's mind element. And then all the remaining cheetahs, 76 remaining cheetahs are called the mind consciousness element. Right. Okay, thank you, Panthi. Um, what does the Arahant do and see um, at, in terms of this cognitive process that precedes death? I have to confess, I haven't reviewed the Arhat's death process before this class. <laughs> but um, certainly the, Ar what, the Arhat would not have any object presenting itself to his or her process signifying a future rebirth. I think, I think that's going to come up in chapter five. So maybe we could take that when we get to chapter five. Okay, thank you, Bhante. Um, why does sense sphere cognitive process last 17 mind moments, <laughs> while the jhana cognitive process can last many mind moments yeah. rapidly? Okay, the reason for this, it said that the sensory cognitive process takes a sense object as its object. The sense object is a material phenomena, and though all phenomena are impermanent, arising and passing away very quickly, very rapidly, but it's said that material phenomena endure for the length of 16 mind moments. And so when a material phenomena impinges on the sense faculty, there's one moment of bhavanga goes by, and then 16, let's see if we can get that. Okay, so an object comes into range. So in this case, a visible form, so it's an eye consciousness. Okay, so that, <clears throat> that, mat that material object is going to endure <coughs> 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 
for <clears throat> so it endures for 17 mind moments. When it first comes into range, one moment of bhavanga goes by. Then it strikes upon the sense faculty and it causes, when it does that, it causes the bhavanga to vibrate. Then the bhavanga gets cut off. Then the cognitive process takes place. And all of these, these chaitas are arising and passing away up until the process ends with the second registration chitta. Now, while all of these chitas are arising and passing, that same visible form is enduring because it's more sort of lasting than the mental events. So the, it's sluggish, it's change is sluggish compared to that of the mental events. So the visible form remains through the 17 chitas, and then it, the visible form ceases with the last moment in the last mind moment in the cognitive process. And so there can't be any further chitas in this cognitive process because now the visible form is no longer available. But what will normally happen if we're looking at the same form is that there's going to be the drop in the bhavanga, then the visible form will impinge again, and then another series of chitas will go by cognizing the visible form, the new visible form. But it's all happening so rapidly that we just see ourselves looking at the same object. But when you get down to this, sort of put a high powered microscope of, I guess, intense, mindfulness and clear comprehension to the process, then you see how the act of knowing an object is made up of these individual mind moments and how the object itself is enduring for these 17 mind moments and then vanishing together with the end of the cognitive process. And then in, in, in jhana bhanti, what happens in jhana? Yeah, so the jhana is not dependent on of a material object as its object. So it's said that in the initial stage when somebody is practicing jhana, then the jhanic process might just last one mind moment. And then maybe once they come out, then they can de develop more skill till they can make the jhana last a bit longer until they can get the skill to make the jhana endure even for a whole day or several days. So that's how you have these meditators who are sitting absorbed in the same jhana, maybe for three days. And in that case, it's just a series, an unbroken series of individual jhana chitas occurring continuously one after another. Right. Because it's not dependent on an external object. Right. Um, and then Bhante, what's the relationship between the substance at the door and the bhavanga, is, is it the same stuff or is it different stuff? How does it interact? I didn't get the idea of the substance. Well, at the, at the base of the sense door, there's a, a sensitive substance, say the eye consciousness, yeah. that, that, that is activated and that interrupts the bhavanga. Yeah. Is it part of the bhavanga or is it a separate thing from the bhavanga? No, it's a separate from the bhavanga. So when a sensory an active, active consciousness is taking place. For example, here, this is an eye door process. Then the bhavanga, you can say it's arrested. Doesn't mean that a policeman arrested and sends it to prison. It means it stops. The bhavanga gets temp tentatively cut off. Then an active cognitive process occurs from the moment of five door adverting to registration then when registration ends, then the bhavanga resumes. I see. But I think that gets the intent of the question. Yes, yeah, so in a sense, are you saying, forgive me, I just want to ask that, in, does that mean the cheetahs arise out of the bhavanga? In a sense, they are the bhavanga now appearing as cheetahs, then fall back into the stream of the bhavanga again. Would that be the proper understanding of that? 
except we wouldn't say that the bhavanga manifests as the active chittas, but the bhavanga tentatively ceases. Or you could say that, well, maybe you could say that, yeah, that the active chittas emerge out of the bhavanga, yes. but they are distinct from the bhavanga. The bhavanga is one type of chitta. The active chittas are different types. Right. Thank you, Bhante. Um, And then there's a question just relating to this jhana thing. Let's quickly do these. What happens with concentrated consciousness and one-pointed focus in terms of mind moments? Do they stop mind moments? or do, I mean, How does it work when someone's in a jhana state? The jhanic state would be a succession of javana chittas, and those javana chittas will be, will be uh, or the, the chittas that are performing that javana function will be the chittas of the particular jhana in which the meditator is absorbed. So let's say the meditator obtains the first jhana. So then their jhanic experience is constituted by the first jhana wholesome chitta performing the function of javana. Does that make it clear? Yes, I think it does, Fanti. Um, then there's a question about nimitta. Is nimitta eye consciousness or mind consciousness? Supposing it's a, a visual nimitta. Yeah, this is something where I have some, where I find something the way the Abhidhamma treats is a bit puzzling or perplexing. Let me go back to the objects. Okay, so the way the Abhidhamma and the Pali commentaries classify the Nimitta, it's the same strange, they classify it or they designate it as a concept. And maybe in our English language, the word concept doesn't seem to work for that. But the, the Pali word is Panyati, with a little wiggle above the goodness. <laughs> okay, for, for us, concept suggests something like a purely intellectual idea, like I have the concept of a book, so a mental idea of what a book is. But if I see in the mitta, it seems like a visual object, and yet technically in the Abhidhamma system, it's classif classified as a panyati, not as visible form. So it seems, I have to say very frankly, things like the mitas don't seem to fall so neatly into the scheme. Because it's like a visual, it's certainly it's like a vi primarily a visual impression, but it's not a form seen with the eye organ. So I would have to say that panyate probably it has a wider range than the English word concept, but would also include mental images, mentally constructed images. Right. So it, it could be called an epistemic form. You sometimes see that word in philosophy. That would probably do the trick for it. So I'm not familiar with that expression. Yes. Epistemic form? Yes, an epistemic form, an object of knowledge. It's not a yeah. it's not a sense object, but it's an object of knowledge, it's an epistemic yeah. form. Yeah, but in the case of the nimitta, it's not just an object of knowing, but it's an object that you're seeing with your mind's eye, but not with the physical eye. Yes. Thank you. And then, um, is there a dominant sense base? Does one sense dominate over the others? I don't think you could say one dominates over the others, but, but or at least in the Abhidhamma scheme doesn't speak about that. But just 
in terms of human experience, I say that there's a certain priority to the eye visual experience, since we rely so heavily on visual experience. Yes. Whereas an animals, certain animals will rely primarily on auditory hearing experience. Or somebody who is blind, the human being who is blind, then can't rely on the visual experience. But for them, the other sense, some of the other senses will become stronger, like the sense of hearing will become stronger. Yes. Thank you, Bhante. And then there's an interesting question about the heart here. Um, how does the cheetah process for both the donor and recipient work in a heart transplant procedure? <laughs> Again, this would be a question that the ancient Abhidhamma formulas of the Abhidhamma didn't, um, I don't think that they ever had to face that question, but what, my, my, this is my guess. The heart base is not, as I said, it's not the physical heart itself, but it's a subtle kind of matter, which is located in the vicinity of the heart. Right. And so even though the heart the physical heart has changed, but for that person, the heart base will still remain the same. Because the heart base does not depend on the identity of the heart that's pumping the blood. That would be my conjecture. Because the is, one of the listeners has said that according to the Abhidhamma, the heart base is referring to a tiny space in our physical heart. Um, I, I believe it's said to be around the physical heart. Oh, uh, just around it. Okay. Right. Thank you, Bhante. Um, and then, why would beings in the fine material and immaterial spheres still experience doubt, restlessness, and delusion? Are these types of cheetahs remaining karmic residues? Okay. Say a being in the, let's say, in the fine material sphere of existence is not completely free of ignorance. In fact, when we read the Buddhist text, we see that many of these brahmanas, those are the beings in the fine material plane, some of them have wrong, a lot of them have the wrong view that we are permanent, eternal, like this is the final goal of the spiritual life. We have realized that we are permanent and eternal. So that is a wrong view arising out of ignorance. And then some of those Brahmas we see in the suttas, they encounter the Buddha's teaching and then they become particularly disturbed and anxious because the Buddha is proclaiming that everything conditioned is impermanent and um, perishable. And then they, they would they come up with the thought, previously we thought we were permanent, now the all-enlightened one is declaring we're impermanent. And so that can cause even anxiety and agitation in them when they hear that. Right. Thank you, Bhante. Um, and some maybe will doubt it and think, okay, previously we thought we were permanent. Are we permanent or are we not permanent? So they have that doubt. And then there's two more questions. One is, um, in the determining chitta, is there any reference to naming, the function of naming, labeling? Yeah, that's, a, a name? yeah, that's, that's an inter interesting question because it said that, that these processes of consciousness go through They usually occur in a series, a complex series. And so in what's called the idol process, at that point, there's no, not yet labeling, designation, conceptualization, but this is simply taking in the object, even though there's a determining consciousness there, but it doesn't yet involve naming, designation, des designation or labeling. But there will be this idor process will be followed probably by a number of idor processes, then they'll take place mind door processes, which absorb the information 
transmitted by the eye door processes and then start to make sense out of the, eye, the data coming from the eye door process and integrating that, that data into a coherent picture in which labeling, designation, and conceptualization then becomes prominent. Hmm. When we get to chapter four, we'll take some, yeah, actually the next month, then we'll see some examples of how that occurs. Right. It's interesting, only 10% of the neurons in the eye band to connect to the brain. 90% mm -hmm. just talk to each other, which is very oh, really? interesting. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, then finally, referring to table 1.1, the 89 and 1 to 1 chitters at a glance, the table indicates that the supramundane chitters consist of eight or 40 chitters. Yeah, yeah. Why the difference? I understand what the eight represents. Okay. What does the 40 represent? Okay, yeah. This is a sort of subtle point. You know, I wanted to avoid it in order to make things, to avoid making things too complicated. Okay, the, it said that the, four, that the path cheetah and the fruition chitta always occurs at a level of meditative absorption. And that meditative absorption in terms of its intensity is graded ac according to the five levels of jhana. So we could say that this is a super mundane or world transcending jhana, different from the fine material sphere jhana, but there are different degrees of the force of samadhi in the path and fruition attainments. So each, so each path attainment can be distinguished according to these five levels. There's no difference in its function. Say the first path consciousness has the same function of eradicating the three grossest defilements and terminating more than seven rebirths, but by way just of the force of concentration, it occurs, it can occur at any of five levels. And so we have four paths and four fruits. So eight super mundane cheetahs, and they can occur at any of these five levels of concentration, the five, the levels of five super mundane jhanas. So five by eight becomes 40. Okay, thank you, Vanti. And there's just one last question on the fine material sphere. Um, given the fact that uh, in order to attain the jhanas, you have to overcome the nivaranas, one of which being doubt. Yeah. The question is, how could a being in the fine material sphere attain jhana if they still have delusion and doubt? Surely they wouldn't be able to be reborn there. They wouldn't have the... No, 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 no. Yeah. To attain the jhana, they suppress the doubt but the doubt is not eradicated, ah. but they're able to sort of temporarily overcome it enough to go into the jhana. And then that jhana, they, they maintain the jhana through the course of the life. And so the doubt is not arising and disturbing the force of their, of their jhana. And then through the force of the jhana, they get reborn in the fine material realm. But in the fine material realm, they're not always absorbed in jhana. And so some, they come out from time to time. I don't know what it's like to be out of jhana in the fine material realm, but when they come out back into sense sphere consciousness, then states of doubt can arise. Like the Brahma, a divine being there, thinks he's permanent and eternal. Then somehow he learns, he gets to witness the Buddha teaching that everything is impermanent. Then he starts to wonder, Am I permanent or am I impermanent? So then the doubt has arisen. <laughs> thank you, Bandy. I will hand back now. That's four o'clock. And so thank you very much, Bandy, for being so generous and answering every question. That okay, thank you. I'll hand back to Wama. Thank you so much, uh, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi, and to Richard, and to all of our friends here who spent the day um, reviewing this chapter together. And we look forward to continuing uh, on August 7th, where we're going through chapter four, the process of consciousness. And um, we will be sending out the recording from today's um, teaching. And as mentioned earlier, if you could give us about a week for us to render the video, 
will be happy to send this along. And for the you, Bhante, many have asked about offerings. Uh, and I know you didn't mention where to make offerings, but I took it upon myself to just um, uh, put in the chat box that if anyone would like to make an offering to Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi and his many activities in Dharma, to please go to eaus.org um, and you can make a, 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 an offering directly to that organization. Yeah, that could be made to the Buddhist, Buddhist Association of the United States. Thank you, Bhante. Um, and the manual itself um, has been offered freely by Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi. And there is a link that I'll be sending out. Maybe um, some of you are asking for passwords, but the link that we were given actually does not need, a, a does not require a password. So it should just be easily, um, you can just put it into your web browser and then you can um, download the um, comprehensive manual. Um, so that concludes today's uh, very um, in-depth uh, <laughs> uh, course on Abhidhamma. I have to say personally, Bhante, I, I'm able to pick up a few of these uh, uh, points, but we have a whole month to, uh, to reflect and to go through the video and to continue to um, reflect on these teachings because as we can see, they're just so profound and allows us to understand a bit more about our mind. Okay, so thank you so much for hosting this. Thank you, Bhante. 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 Thank you, Okay, take thanks. care, Bhante. <laughs> take care, Bhante. Be safe, Bhante. Bye, Bhante. Okay, bye, bye. Bye, Mami, Bhante. Mami, Chapa. Okay, bye, bye. Bye, bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Bye, bye. Thank okay, you, bye, bye. Bye now. Bye. Bye now.